80, 100 hours a week, lots of travel, boom, you know, 16 kilos heavier, most of that on my waistline, five more inches on the waist. So I think a lot of times we focus on young people and how they are not focusing on their health, right? And what it's like to be young and healthy and not, um, not aware of what's going on. Uh, and one of the things that uh, you need to, this is the precautionary phase. But as you grow older, um, well, you age, and with age comes certain things, more risk factors that uh, accumulate over time. And I certainly don't feel, uh, I just turned 30 and I definitely don't feel like I was when I was 20 or when I was 13 for that matter. And I'm just wondering whether we can explore this a bit more. And I think I was going to start with you because I think your own journey in terms of health has taken, has been quite comprehensive in that sense. It's been a roller coaster ride. <laughs> I mean, because I, I, was a, I was a very competitive athlete in the university. And then after that, you start working. Mm. And it's 80, 100 hours a week, lots of travel. You come back to the hotel room at 10 o'clock and you've got room service dinner. And 10 years of that without realizing small incremental changes, boom, you know, 16 kilos heavier, most of that on my waistline, five more inches on the waist. Uh, uh, so, you know, it was suddenly a wake up call. And you, you don't notice it. It's like that proverbial frog in, in the boiling water, mm. right? Because you're boiling that water slowly, you don't notice it. While I tried to make changes for the next two years after that, hardly anything. Mm until it suddenly you reach an inflection point where boom, you lose 10 kilos of weight and all that. But it, it took that amount of effort. And this is why I think people who try to do it after two or three months and they don't see immediate results, they give up. They don't realize that if you've loaded up 10, 12 years of bad habits on your body, it's not gonna go away in two to three months. Right? It takes a lot longer than that. It is not simple to change behavior, um, change habits. You need a strong why um, internally. External is important as well. I'm sure mm -hmm. you had the support of Completely. your family, um, of people who you know who you seek support from. Um, however, the why I, I think we have to talk a bit more about the why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know when we talk about making changes to your health, um, Emily, you um, were already actually very healthy, uh, or what you thought was healthy at mm -hmm. that point, mm -hmm. and you had to I think make some really. Uh, big changes in your own life and I think you got leukemia two years ago, is that right? I wouldn't say it's a big change in terms of my lifestyle, food and physical lifestyle, but the big change I made was prioritizing my relationships. Mm -hmm. When I say relationships, I don't mean just a romantic relationship, I mean my connection with my family members, mm -hmm. connection with friends. When I start to prioritize that, it thus fed the oxytocin that I realized that is what my body in, is in tune with, that is what my body wants and seeks but I had kind of isolated myself by being very busy and accumulating stress factors, stress triggers that I never consciously registered as stress triggers. How different is your life from before your diagnosis and after? Did you, what were the big changes that you had I to make? I talk way less <laughs> about these things. Before it was always like, oh, self-help books, I don't need that. You know, talk about feelings, I don't need that, I got this. You know, mm. your, your mind tricks you into thinking you are invincible. Mm. Don't we touch about this yeah. uh, before. And, and, but also what that tells me is my mind is strong. Mm -hmm. So if I strengthen it the suitable way, then my body and physiologically, it should change. Mm -hmm. It should make positive adaptations. Our priorities changes over life and circumstances, events happen that change our whys as well, can change our whys as well. For example, yeah. Emily's example. I think we need to continually examine our priorities in life and I think you need to, for, to do that, you need to take a step back and, you know, spend a little time, quiet time thinking. Sure. The most powerful intrinsic motivators that distinguish those who were successful versus those who were not, one common theme is when you define your intrinsic motivation, as your role in uh, how do you positively impact others. So the role as a parent, if you define yourself as a parent and you need to be healthy because who else is gonna take care of your kids, mm. that counts. If you say, look, it's really important for me to be healthy because no one else is gonna take care of my aging parents, those are powerful motivators. Things that were not powerful was like, 
got to fit in the wedding dress, right? <laughs> got to win this point, got to win this biggest loser competition, right? Yeah. Because my doctor says so, right? When it's focused on me or some kind of external metric, didn't really, wasn't really as sticky mm. as when you define your purpose as I've got to impact others. And I think that speaks to the larger thing that why power is essential. Um, the motivation behind what uh, we do uh, in picking up the habits and dropping bad ones because while we all may age differently, um, the way we power the different things that we do to keep healthy, um, that is what's going to be very essential to keep things going. I think you've exemplified that through your own, uh, Emily, you've done that in your own, uh, your own why power has changed and having that extrinsically come in is, uh, is essential really.